In April 2011, the nation came together to celebrate a royal wedding. The new royal couple, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. As Catherine Middleton and Prince William married in front of a global audience of billions, memories came flooding back of another royal wedding that had taken place 30 years earlier. The marriage of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer was a moment that would transform both of their lives. In sickness and in health. And eventually lead to controversy and tragedy. There was no inkling that it could have gone so awfully wrong. But for that one day, on the 29th of July, 1981, this was a modern day fairy tale. This was a wedding that the whole nation fell in love with. And what an extraordinary moment for the new Princess of Wales. A beautiful girl, a handsome prince. To me, it was glorious. This is a story of that day, told by those who were there. We'll hear from the fans. Good to see red, white and blue, like a, a wave going like this. It was incredible. The television presenters. I remember feeling, I've got to get this right because it's going out to millions of people. And the royal bridesmaid. 30 years ago, I stood on these steps right here in front of this extraordinary building. We'll tell the story behind that famous wedding dress. It was one of the world's best kept fashion secrets. And reunite the dress with the man who designed it. It's going to be strange seeing the dress again. I, I'm getting very emotional about it. It was a day in my life I'll never forget. It really, really was the wedding of the century. St. Paul's Cathedral, June 2011. As ever, the cathedral is busy with tourists, but one visitor has a special reason to be here. 30 years ago, India Hicks stood on these steps as a 13-year-old girl, waiting for the soon-to-be Princess Diana to arrive. Today, India has flown to London from her home in the Bahamas to recall her memories of being royal bridesmaid for the wedding of the century. So it's extraordinary for me to think that 30 years ago, I stood on these steps right here in front of this extraordinary building. There was guards lining the stairs and we stood here waiting for the carriage to come. And I think what was really amazing was to look up and see that all of these windows had people leaning out, Union Jacks everywhere, screaming, crying, excitement. Every single spot along here was just packed full of people. We could hear the carriage obviously drawing closer because the crowd was beginning to scream with anticipation. The carriage drew up, and we opened the door. It really was a Cinderella moment. It really was. There she was, the young girl about to become one of the world's most famous princesses. So how did this historic moment come about? And why did it capture the public's imagination in such a spectacular fashion? After all, at the start of 1981, the mood of the nation was far from joyous. Back then, Britain was a country in crisis. Unemployment figures were soaring, and strikes had brought the nation to its knees. The very beginning of the Thatcher era. The ladies not for turning. <laughs> this star was coming out of those there was a lot of division, there was a lot of tension, there was a lot of industrial unrest. Maggie, Maggie, Maggie! <laughs> and then out of all of this came this fairy tale, this story of a young woman meeting her Prince Charming. After months of speculation, it's official. Prince Charles is to marry Lady Diana Spencer. On the 24th of February, 1981, the news came that the nation had been waiting for. Can you take us back to when you first met? If um, you can remember. Can you remember yes, when you first met? Yes, yes, certainly can. It was 1977. Charles came to stay. His friend of my 
sister Sarah's, uh, for a shoot. We sort of met in a ploughed field. <laughs> I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. And, I mean, great fun. Mm. And bouncy and full of life and everything. And um, um, I don't know what you thought of me. But... Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Born into one of Britain's most aristocratic families, Lady Diana Spencer was the latest in a line of eligible young women to have caught the prince's eye. Charles's love life had long been the subject of intense scrutiny. After what was thought to be a short-lived romance with Camilla Parker Bowles in the early 70s, he had dated a string of society beauties. He was drop-dead eligible and We'd followed his peregrinations with women in Australia, in Britain, and all over for years. He was accompanied by very, very glamorous women, and everybody was waiting to find out who he was going to marry. In 1977, Charles began dating Lady Sarah Spencer. It was on a visit to the Spencer family home at Althorpe that he met his future bride, Sarah's younger sister, Diana. But it wasn't until the summer of 1980 that Diana and the Prince became an item. It was the Sun's royal photographer, Arthur Edwards, who broke the story. I was told at a polo match that Prince Charles was there with a girl called Lady Diana Spencer. So when I saw this girl and she was wearing a D necklace, I thought that might be her. I said, are you Diana Spencer? She said, yes. I said, may I take your photograph, please? She said, yes, of course. And then she posed that for me. <laughs> She was just 19, and I remember thinking to myself, he's not running around with teenagers. Charles was 30 now. And then two months later, I'm up at Balmoral, and who do I see fishing on the riverbank? Prince Charles. And who's with him? Lady Diana Spencer. So, bosh, the old alarm bells went off. That was it. I knew then that this was the girl, because it had been kept so secret. It was the world's first glimpse of a shy young kindergarten assistant who would become one of the most famous women of the 20th century, and the beginning of a media obsession that continues to this day. She was demure and shy, and so we were intrigued and fascinated and, and wanted to know more and more and more about her. There was that incredible look that she had, which, which she carried right through her life, which was, you know, it was just a head slightly down, which, of course, the photographers absolutely loved. When you photographed her, I mean, one photographer described like a clap of thunder going off. When she smiled down your camera, you kind of knew you was in the paper. As speculation mounted that a royal wedding could be on the cards, Diana's world was about to change beyond recognition. Can it, is it any possibility of any announcement of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything. Please. Former nanny Mary Clark recalls that Diana had speculated about her future marriage when she was just nine years old. I was asking her about her school, and then she changed the subject completely and just announced, when I grow up, I'm never going to get married unless I'm in love. She'd seen the divorce of her parents and the upset that it had caused. She clearly didn't want to make the same mistake herself. And I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> in love, me. Yes. Two weeks after announcing their engagement, the new couple officially stepped out together, and the world was about to see a new side to the bride-to-be. The palace did not know in advance about the dress she chose to wear. It was off the shoulder, and by normal royal standards, it was fairly revealing. The then little-known husband and wife design team of Elizabeth and David Emmanuel were behind the little black dress that hit the headlines. It was the first time she was seen with Prince Charles, and it caused a huge furore in the press. Up until then, we'd seen her as a very simple kindergarten teacher. But when that limousine pulled up, out stepped a movie star. Suddenly, he didn't have what the press called a shy die. He had this fabulous, glamorous woman. 
As preparations got underway for the wedding of the century, David Emmanuel received a phone call he would never forget. Picked it up and said, would we do the honor of making her wedding gown? And you know, it doesn't get better than that. Everyone was desperate to know the details of the dress, but the Emmanuels were tight-lipped. Early days, from now till, till the end, to the day of the wedding, we'll be working on it. It was really one of the world's best-kept fashion secrets. They didn't let one detail slip. We would go and stand outside their salon and look at the windows, which were all blacked out. Elizabeth perfected an art of doing an interview and talking about the dress and not revealing a single, a single detail. The Emmanuels and their team worked day and night to create a fairy tale dress unlike anything that had been seen before. It was scarlet O'Hara, it was gone with the wind, it was tight bodices, corsets and huge balloon skirts and silk handmade roses and antique lace. She loved it, it was dressing up time. It was like a little girl's dream of, of, of dressing up. The design required hundreds of meters of hand-woven silk taffeta. 10,000 mother-of-pearl sequins, and most famously of all, a 25-foot-long train. We said, I've looked up through the archives, and I think the largest train to date is 20 foot. So I said, well, that's kind of boring. Should we make it bigger? And she said, oh. I said, well, St. Paul's is huge. OK, how, how, 25, yeah, OK, 25 foot. So that's how it, I mean, truly came about. But the worry was that the train would be too big for St. Paul's Cathedral. This and I went in a taxi with a tape measure and we <laughs> measured the width of the aisle. We wanted it quite sweeping, but we obviously we didn't want to hit the seats on the way down. Well, I make it perhaps just a shade over three yards. With the wedding dress underway, the Emmanuels turned their attention to the bridesmaids. They included 13-year-old India Hicks, goddaughter of Prince Charles. It was a special time for me because it was the time I got to know Diana. And obviously, I've been invited very much by Charles and his side of the family. And I had never met Diana before until those fittings. There was that real feeling of feeling very special. And then there was the realization that I was going to have to wear a dress. And I was a complete tomboy. I spent all of my life riding bareback on ponies and not wearing dresses. So here is the bridesmaid's dress in all its glory, bows. Pearls, lace, frills, lots of scratchy petticoats, um, and sort of buttercup yellow sash, more bows on the back. It was the 1980s. I can sympathize now with why it was so flamboyant, uh, but it was difficult for a tomboy. Next, as the big day arrives, Britain is gripped by wedding fever. I had an incredible feeling of a moment in history. And the bride-to-be finds an unusual way of conquering her pre-wedding nerves. Diana started to sing, and we all suddenly started to sing, and that was quite a surprising moment. July 1981, and after a year blighted by strikes and rioting, Britain finally had something to celebrate. It's getting on a bit, isn't it? About the time we got married. I think it's really great. I think she's just the right person for him. The marriage of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer had captured the public's imagination, and as the big day approached, it was clear that something special was building. People love weddings, but this was a wedding that the whole nation fell in love with. Good luck, sir. Everyone seemed to think they knew Charles and Diana and, and were excited about it. Our crown prince marries beautiful, beautiful Diana. That whole summer we seemed to be floating on air. It was just, uh, it was unbelievable. On July the 28th, the streets of London were already packed with revellers. As people bedded down for the night, the wedding of the century was just hours away. Well, the big day has arrived. In four hours' time, Charles Philip Arthur George Mountbatten Windsor marries Diana Frances Spencer, and Britain and the world will celebrate the wedding of the Prince and Princess of Wales. 
On the morning of the 29th of July, we woke up very early, and I remember my mum getting china bowls out um, because she wouldn't have paper plates or anything like that, and we were clanking away at about half past five, six o'clock in the morning eating cornflakes on the pavement. All a bit bruised, but nonetheless so excited. Couldn't wait to see Princess Diana. Tim Hewitt was one of ITV's roving reporters on the Mall. I remember walking up the Mall with my camera crew, talking to people. People were sleeping in the streets, they were having parties in the streets, they were having picnics in the street, and it was extraordinary. While close to a million people lined the streets of London, the rest of Britain prepared to mark the day with their own celebrations. Thousands of street parties took place across the country as 28 million viewers settled down in front of their TV screens to watch events unfold. Presenting the royal wedding to one of the largest audiences in TV history was a daunting task, especially for a new recruit. I'd come down from Grantham Television as a young, fairly young, uh, reporter. And the first big thing that I was asked to do was the royal wedding. Watched by the biggest audience in television history, a sixth of the world's population. I was pitched in, right in at the deep end, and I remember feeling I've got to get this right because it's going out to millions of people. I was madly trying to remember as many people as I could, just in case I got landed with one of those moments, you know, fill, fill for a minute on, on what you can see in the monitor. ITV's man at St Paul's Cathedral was Martin Lewis. There's just a slight hint of pre-wedding nerves here. They're cleaning the front steps for what uh, I think has got to be the fourth time in the last ten minutes. What I was trying to do was to record, if you like, the minutiae of the preparations, to try to give people a feeling of everything that goes into the, the hours before it actually happens. Well, the people who are going to need very few souvenirs except their memories are the hundreds of people who have waited out here all night. It was one of the biggest news stories that you could imagine, and the effort that went into it from the television production side was enormous. More live pictures now as we go round our cameras at key points along the route, first to Clarence House and Leonard Parkin. Up here on the third floor of Clarence House, in the guest suite, above there, where there are troughs of geraniums, Lady Diana is getting ready. She's just peeped out of that bay window. Bridesmaid India Hicks was inside Clarence House that morning with Diana. Normally in a royal household, everything is very quiet. But I do remember a certain amount of mayhem in this, and I think that that was because there were outside characters, the Emmanuels, for instance. Diana had a little TV on, on her dressing table, and the hair and makeup has been doing. We were watching it, and there were some guards, I think the Royal Welsh Guards were going past, and we go, oh, and, and there they were, looking out the window at Clarence House, and they were going down the mall. She had insisted this little television screen was set up there. It's Charles Clark, Lady Diana's hand. And she was fascinated, of course, to see herself on it. So whenever anybody got in the way, she would say, no, no, move, move. Glued to the TV screen, Diana surprised everyone when the ads came on. It was at the time where there was that wonderful advertisement going on, just one cornetto. And Diana started to sing, and we all suddenly started to sing, just one cornetto. And, and that was quite a surprising moment, and something that really has stuck out in my mind. High spirits were all around, and thousands of police officers were on duty to keep the growing crowds in check. I don't think the country had ever seen a bigger police operation. Something like 5,000 officers were involved. You have to remember that the IRA were very active on the British mainland in those days, and the police response to it reflected that. One of the bobbies on duty that day was 20-year-old David Rogers, who was positioned near Buckingham Palace. Our instructions were to constantly look at the crowds. We weren't there to observe the royal procession. Our sole job was to look at, very carefully, the crowd in front of us. Officers were encouraged to get to know their section of the crowd under a scheme known as Adopt-a-Bobby. 
you couldn't get to the feeding stations because there's too many people there. And we totally relied on the public to give us sandwiches and drinks. Non-alcoholic, of course. <laughs> With the clock ticking down to the start of the wedding, the final preparations were being made. It was a machine that ran like clockwork. Everything is timed to the last minute, as it should be, you know. It's a world event and it's a palace event. David Emmanuel was putting the finishing touches to Diana's dress. And I just happened to say to her, I said, Diana, did you check the petticoat? And she says, no. So I'm now, can you imagine, wing collar, cravat, frock coat, carnation, but I've got to double check. As I'm coming resurface from under her wedding gown on the morning of her wedding, Diana said, oh, David, have you met the Queen Mother? And the, as I come out from under her petticoat, there is the Queen Mother standing there. I said, oh, right, OK. But she was gracious, as she always was, and we had to laugh about it because you had to laugh. As the ceremony drew nearer, excitement built along the route of the wedding procession. In a sea of red, white and blue, there was one face that caught the photographer's eye. Brian Barmer encapsulated the patriotism of the day. The Times would dub him the face of Britain. Different cameramen kept coming up, different radio interviewers kept coming up, TV people came up just because of my painted face. How long did it take to, uh, to get your makeup on this morning? <laughs> this morning, um, all did it in two stages this morning, roughly about an hour. An hour? Yeah. Is it worth it? Yeah, of course it is. Everything seemed to be like focused around me, and my friends were getting a bit fed up with this, but I stayed. The whole country at that time was whipped up with the idea of national pride in something that we could be proud of. The amount of flags around the country, not just on my face, but the amount of flags around the country, just unbelievable. Outside St Paul's, photographers gathered to capture the guests as they arrived to take their seats in the cathedral. When most people get married, they get the family there. Uh, but with Prince Charles, he got, he got the family there and everybody he'd had anything to do with in his life. The policeman that used to guard him in Switzerland, the, the, his favourite comedian. Now, Harry, of course, this is your number one firm getting married. Yes, it did, lovely, eh? Yes, we're at the, we're at the party at, uh, on Monday night. Mm -hmm. We managed to say a few words to him. Like, like what? Like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and how did he respond? <laughs> he said hello back. The invited guests were coming so thick and fast. Oh, was that really Spike Milligan? Was that really Margaret Thatcher? I had the main aisle seat, so a fabulous view of everyone coming in. There was a buzz, a buzz of people arriving, just absorbing the whole atmosphere. Finally, at 20 past 10, the royal family's carriages left for St Paul's. When the procession obviously left Buckingham Palace, down the Mall, it was... the noise was incredible. Everybody that came out that we recognised got a massive cheer. I just felt, gosh, what I wouldn't give to live that life. I probably had one of the best views in the house, because I was a lot closer than anyone else. Unfortunately, of course, I was told to look at the crowd and not the other way. <laughs> I have to say, standing on the steps of St Paul's, I had an incredible feeling of a moment in history. You had to pinch yourself occasionally. Wow, I'm so lucky to be here. Just after half past ten, waiting fans had their first glimpse of the bride as she left for the cathedral in a glass wedding coach. Diana's father got into the carriage. Diana then had to get into the carriage. But before we could, we had sort of folding sheets. 25 foot. It was so much fabric. We was kind of stuffing it in in the end. I'm thinking, Lordy Lord, what is going to come out the other end, you know? But uh, And then she drove off. As the royal family took their seats, the world was just minutes away from the wedding of the century. All that remained was for the bride to arrive. 
Still to come, last minute nerves for the designers of the dress. There is the entire royal family. That's the only time I got nervous. And the fashion secret that would go down in history. I mean, this was the dress to end all dresses. On the morning of July the 29th, 1981, Lady Diana Spencer was on her way to becoming a princess. Inside St. Paul's, the groom was taking his last steps as a single man. And waiting outside were bridesmaids Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones and India Hicks. I think for Sarah and I, it was, it was all so surreal. You're waiting with your heart slightly beating and everybody's in uniform. It's very romantic, the whole feeling. The carriage drew up. I mean, it really was Cinderella moment. You know, there is a glass carriage, for God's sakes, with horses. Britain's biggest ever fashion secret was about to be revealed with the debut of the dress. We stood exactly on cue where we were told to stand, and there is the entire British royal family. That's the only time I got nervous. And that's when I thought, oh, God, I hope they like it. When we saw miles of silk and this glorious, glossy girl, it was one of those moments when you felt, gosh, you know, you know, I don't really want to say anything, I don't want to do anything, just want to sit and look at this image that was coming in. But within seconds, as more and more of the dress unfurled, the audience's reaction changed. Everybody just went in horror at the, the crumpled mess that was revealed. So we were really working very hard to get that material into where it was meant to be, into position. She had been a little squashed, to be honest, squashed in this carriage. There's no other word for it, squashed. I just knew by the time she got to the top of the stairs, I was going to get my hands on this girl very smartly. So it was a lot of what we call in the fashion world, zhuzhin. David Emmanuel had no idea that millions would see him putting the final touches to the bride's outfit. That whole thing of arranging her and checking, I thought that was all going to be private. I honestly thought it was going to be totally private because you never saw that at royal weddings. You never saw behind the scenes. With all the final checks done, Diana waited for her cue to walk down the aisle. I can remember turning and looking at the entrance to St. Paul's and seeing Diana framed there with her father. A quick image flashed through my mind of Diana as that young girl when I had practically an impossible task to ever get her in a skirt and out of trousers. And here she was in a real, real wedding dress. And she just looked so wonderful walking down the aisle. I remember clearly seeing Diana with her father and feeling, you know, what a relief for him because we'd been through his illness, he'd had this dreadful stroke. People weren't quite sure whether he'd be able to walk down the aisle with his daughter and give his daughter away. To see him do his bit was, I, I, I know, a high point f for me. With Diana delivered safely to the altar, Prince Charles reassured his beautiful bride. He said, you look wonderful. She said, wonderful for you. We are gathered here to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Resting after her ordeal with the bride's long train, the bridesmaid found herself sitting next to royalty from far, far away. The King of Tonga is an impressive size, as he should be, because in the Kingdom of Tonga, your importance is measured by your weight. I remember him and his wife passing sweeties down the line to me. It was wonderful. I had the best place in the church. Charles Philip Arthur George, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife? Outside the cathedral, members of the public crowding onto the streets of London were desperate to hear what was going on. It's not like the recent royal wedding. You didn't have uh, everyone, you know, watching on their mobile devices what was happening inside. You didn't have a sound feed. 
coming out of the cathedral. You had a few people who'd got radios, you know, to their ears. Wilt thou love her, comfort her? It went totally silent. And all you could hear was the transistor radios. They're all intently listening in to the service. There was no other sound, just transistor radios. Diana Francis. Wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband? With the crowds hanging on to every word, they could hear the emotion inside St Paul's spread across the airwaves. So long as ye both shall live. I will. But partway through the vows, the nerves of the young bride kicked in. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Well, I was listening to the, this transistor radio, and instead of saying uh, Charles Philip, she said Philip Charles. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. Whole crowd just had a sharp intake of pressure. <sighs> to my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. The Archbishop of Canterbury didn't even ask her to correct it. I think it just carried on as normal. And, uh, you know, one of his names were there anyway. <laughs> Bless, O oh Lord, this ring, and grant that he who gives it and she who shall wear it may remain faithful to each other. With this ring. With this ring. I thee wear. I thee wear. With my body. My body. I thee wear. I pronounce that they be man and wife together. It was a chance for people to be taken out of themselves into what was almost a fairy tale world. With the ceremony over, a new princess was born. The royal family were elated. The Queen Mother looked so, so proud of Charles as he walked past her, because, you know, he was her favourite. And uh, she was beaming with pride, the Queen was beaming with pride, and, you know, um, we thought this marriage would last forever. I thought, there she goes on the way to a completely different life to anything that she's ever experienced before. She was now part of the royal family. The moment that they stepped out, then everyone was pushing forward, then everyone was trying to create an interview, and the crowd again just erupted. One person with a bird's eye view of the newlyweds was royal photographer Arthur Edwards, who was on top of a nearby building. As she walked down the steps, then I noticed this train. I suddenly realized that this was the right position. And of course, I got this picture, which, uh, which you know, got hugely published in the paper the next day. <laughs> What made it was the headline above the picture was the, the train now standing at St Paul's. Amid euphoric scenes, the fairy tale prince and princess set off back to the palace. They were just a wonderful couple receiving the adulation of the nation. In a sense, it was a dream for her and all the, particularly the ladies who were lining the route. They could see themselves as her, so they were, in a sense, sharing the dream. Coming up, a moment in history that would flash around the world. Everybody just desperately wanted them to kiss. When they did, everybody cheered. Oh, that's what everybody's been waiting for. And David Emmanuel is reunited with his fairy tale creation. This is it. Oh, wow. This brings back a few memories. As the newlyweds arrived back at Buckingham Palace, tens of thousands of well wishers were led down the mall by a cordon of police officers. I thought this is amazing. I thought it was an impromptu thing. In hindsight, it also been well planned. Because we were just told, when the crowd comes up to where you are, you join the front where the police officers are. So we were probably five, six, seven deep, probably deeper than that. And we slowly marched the people 
down towards Buckingham Palace. I didn't know how many people actually were behind me. That's the one and only time I've ever walked up the centre of the mount. see this sea of humanity coming through. Of course, we'd never seen that before. It's the first time. We were all absolutely amazed at it, to see so many people out on the streets moving so harmoniously towards the palace. The tension was rising. Everybody was excited. Uh, my mum and her friend had a huge white piece of cloth and painted fantastic on it in red, and it was just waving in the wind. I remember thinking, any minute now, I'm going to see Princess Diana. And that was the most exciting thing. We just wanted to see her. Absolutely so excited. While the public waited in expectation outside the gates, behind the closed doors of Buckingham Palace, the Queen's cousin, Patrick Litchfield, was tasked with taking the official wedding photographs. He came armed with a whistle and he blew the whistle to bring us all into attention. And my God, we stood to attention when that whistle blew. <laughs> Andrew started to tell appalling jokes. I can't remember quite how filthy they were, but I'm sure they were fairly filthy. And there was one moment where Diana just started to laugh so much and she just collapsed down onto the floor. The dress billowed up around her, Charles then slumped down on the floor, and we all just fell about on the floor, utterly exhausted. And it is a wonderful moment that's been captured for history, for posterity. It was so unroyal. And I said to Patrick afterwards, I don't think they'll ever release that. He said, I don't think so. And they did. And I just thought that was kind of modern. It was real. Outside, the crowds had started to chant for a glimpse of the bride. On the Victoria Memorial, photographers were poised to capture the image of the day. Finally, at a quarter past one, Charles and Diana stepped out onto the most famous balcony in the world. I have been very blessed, and I've stood on that balcony before, so I had seen crowds below, but nothing compared to that day. It's the one moment where we really all connect. The royal family are just as eager to come out and to see the people below as the people are to see the royal family above. But it was on the royal's fourth balcony appearance that a moment took place which was to provide the most unforgettable image of the day. Everybody was shouting for them to have a kiss. Everybody just desperately wanted them to kiss. And when they did, everybody cheered. That's when I think I wanted to definitely marry a prince for sure. <laughs> I think it was at that point I thought, yeah, I want to do this, I'm going to like Prince Andrew or something. <laughs> I think the kiss was a big surprise and not planned in the least. No royal bride and groom had ever kissed on that balcony before. And although it looked just a perfunctory kiss, it was a millisecond. Ah, oh, that's what everybody's been waiting for. But great photographers missed that. Some were changing film, some were changing lenses. But one person who did capture the moment was photographer Arthur Steele. Never dreamed, nobody ever said that they would kiss. Before they kissed, Charles lifted her hand and kissed her. I then kind of sensed a different kind of movement. I could see something different was happening. And I seen them moving in and puckering up to each other and bump. And it was gone. To be very honest, I didn't realize that virtually everybody else missed it. 
I'm just bloody happy I got the picture. <laughs> very, very happy and relieved. As the royal family disappeared from the balcony for the final time, the crowds in the mall began to disperse. Coming away from the palace, it left such a mark on me the whole day, the Britishness of it. A timeless memory that I don't think anybody who's there will forget. Bear in mind, I've been on my feet now since about 5.30 in the morning. We just laid down in St James's Park. That was the first time I'd sat down at all for the whole day. In towns and cities across the nation, people partied long into the night. But there was one last surprise for David Emmanuel. The whole world was partying. Who is calling my studio? Hello, it's Diana. I just wanted to say it was magical. Prince Charles loved it. We had such a wonderful time. Thank you so much. That's how special it was. That, to me, was my blessing. That's it. The bride was happy, the groom was happy, done. May we see your son, your Royal Highness? Within a year of the wedding, Prince William was welcomed into the world. The Followed two years later by Prince Harry. Everyone thought the future of the royal family was secure. Obviously, it looked as if it was going to be such a perfect marriage, didn't it? There was no inkling that it could have gone the way it went, so awfully wrong. Announcements by the Prime Minister and by Buckingham Palace made it official today, ending months of speculation. The Prince and Princess of Wales are to separate. We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. Like everyone, when I heard that Diana had died, I was absolutely shocked and felt the waste of this young life. Yes, it was a huge loss. Everybody knew so much about her through the media that they knew her better than the neighbors who lived two doors down the road. I went to um, St. James's Palace and I left some flowers there and I just sat for a while afterwards, just to reflect on the royal wedding day, really. Just really sad for a young woman to leave two children behind. Very, very sad. Thirtieth of June, two thousand and eleven, on the eve of what would have been Diana's fiftieth birthday, David Emmanuel visits Althorpe. Diana's childhood home and final resting place. He's here to visit the famous wedding dress, which has just arrived back in Britain after touring the world. I don't think you can visit all the past without being affected by the memory of Diana. You have to remember, this is the place where she grew up as a little girl, and this is the place where she's buried. It's extraordinary to think what tomorrow, she, you know, had Diana been alive, she would have been 50. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to put into words. I, I'm getting very emotional about it, but it is hard. Um, it's just a shame she's not here. She was a big part of my life, very special lady. And I remember the fun we had and the fittings, and she was such full of life, and we had a laugh. It's going to be strange seeing the dress again, because I haven't seen the wedding dress for, for quite some time. It better be in good nick. I hope it, I hope that looks after it. Ah, this is it. Oh, wow. This brings back a few memories. 
Well, the good news is it's still sparkling. We like the sparkle. When I look at this, I can picture her on her wedding day. It was like she, she put it on yesterday. It's bizarre. She was so happy on that day. You can't take that away. This girl was so passionate in love. They say that she was, you know, a fairy tale princess, and uh, she was. This whole wedding magically pulled the whole country together. It's hard to believe. It's all because of her. Everybody loved her, you see. It was just one of those days when you felt everything was right, everything came together perfectly. I'm enormously proud to have been a part of that wedding and, and to have been a little bit of history. I've never seen anything before or since that has got the nation so involved. It was... Um, a one in a million day, one in a billion day, which I'll never forget. That image of her in this dress will last forever. Harry faces a deadly threat this weekend. Dangerous criminal Sirius Black is on the run, but that could be the least of his worries tomorrow afternoon. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban is at 5.40. Tonight's movie, though, sees Sly Stallone and Julianne Moore star in Assassins after the news. <laughs>